welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. If you would stand on your feet, I'm going to get down on my knees. And let's go before the Lord together in prayer as we approach the Word of God today. And let's believe God that the Holy Spirit will come and be our teacher. Father, we come to you today in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we give you thanks. We give you praise for what you've already done in this church service. God, we're so privileged and honored that you would grace us with your presence, God. Where your presence is there, your power is as well. And God, we thank you for what you've already done in this church service. Thank you for the touch of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the healings, miracles, signs, and wonders that have already happened, Lord. And God, you're good and your mercy endures forever, as we just sang, God. We're, we're so blessed to be in the house of the Lord. We're excited and we rejoice. God, now as we open up your word, we pray that you would open it up to us, open us up to receive it. God, may we have eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that have a good understanding. Lord, may we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Lord, we would ask that your Holy Spirit come and be our teacher, be our guide, give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction that we need. How wise you are that you can speak to each person in this room individually and speak right to their situation, God. We praise you, Lord. God, we don't just ask this blessing for ourselves. Also, we would ask it for all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, there are brothers and sisters. We love them, God. We don't see ourselves as better than anybody, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. God, we give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. 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 You can have a seat. Get your Bible out. I'd like to welcome those of you that are watching online as well during this time all over the nation and around the world. We're just uh, privileged that you would join us online today, and I believe God's going to speak to you right where you're at, wherever you're at, all over the world. Hebrews chapter 5. We've been in Hebrews chapter 5, and in verse number 9, we've been in verse number 9. This is actually our fifth time in Hebrews chapter 5, verse Number nine, the word of God is not meant to be fast food, but it's meant to be good food where you take time and you digest it and you get everything you can out of it. And so what we do in this church, if you're joining us for the first time, is we go line upon line, precept upon precept. We believe that God wrote it that way. Therefore, we ought to be able to understand it that way. Just like building a wall, you put one brick upon the, what you just built, the foundation of the brick before it, and you keep going and everything lines up. And at the end of it all, you have a connected structure. There's something that's built that can hold up. And so in our lives, what we're doing as we approach the Word of God verse by verse, brick by brick, adding things to our lives, building things into our lives that will help us to stay strong and steady in the way of God. Today, Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 9, let's read it again. It says, and having been perfected, speaking of Jesus, having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Now, past couple of times we've been in this verse together, we've been in a series called Proof of Our Believing. And this is actually part number four of the Proof of Our Believing. Remember, we talked about this verse, Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 9, and we saw some things in this verse talking about the proof of our believing. That having been perfected, Jesus became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Notice that it didn't say to all who just believe in him. Even though we know that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord then you will be saved. But here it says that he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. In other words, this is not just about a mental ascent, not just about surface level belief where we acknowledge something with our minds and then it goes no further. No, what we believe should actually be expressed in what we do. And the proof of our belief is in our obedience to him. If I could remind you of some of the statements we've made throughout this series, that what we do is an expression of what we believe. And that it starts in our hearts. That this is not about just the surface level activities. This is not about just mere words or mere deeds. But rather this is about an expression of the heart. That it starts with the heart. And and then it continues in our actions, in our activities. Let me put it to you like this. That what we believe about God. What we know to be true about God. The things that we have heard. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when we hear the word of God, we believe it. We have faith for it. But then it doesn't stop there. No. Now all of a sudden that faith, that belief is, is turning into something. It's a conviction. It's a passion on the inside that moves us and drives us to live the life that we live for Jesus Christ. And that's really what this series has been all about. I wish we had time to review everything. I wish we had time to go back over all of the points, but we don't have time to do all that today. There's just been too much said. It's too good. And the teaching team here at The Rock is too phenomenal to, to try and sum it all up in a couple of minutes. But I would encourage you, the, the, the 
all the series is online for free. You can download it, podcast it, whatever you need to do. Or if you want to purchase a CD, they're over there at the CD counter and you can get a hold of that. So I would encourage you, if you haven't heard the, the, the past three parts, get a hold of those and get a hold of the word of God for your life. But today you'll, you'll be blessed nonetheless. You'll, you'll, you'll be right on board with us and today's message also can stand alone. And so you'll get something from the things of God. Now, when we take a look at the proof of our believing, when we take a look at the things that we do, we find out that our beliefs, when they are acted on, it does something in our life. In other words, there is, is a, a, a fruit. That it starts with our heart. Remember, we just made this statement that our belief starts in our heart, but then it's expressed in our activities, in our actions, in our words, and in our deeds. And so when our beliefs are acted on, it produces something. So the heart is the root, and the action is the fruit. There's an expression that takes place. And so today, I want to take a look at a couple of things that when our beliefs are acted on, happen in our lives. Making this statement, you can see it up there on the overhead, beliefs that are acted on. And that's actually the beginning of a sentence. We'll complete that sentence three times today to find out what happens when our beliefs are acted on. Okay? Everybody good with that? All right. First row is, but how about y'all in the back? You guys okay? All right. Praise the Lord. You guys showed up. Good deal. Beliefs that are acted on, number one, are known and declared by the Lord. Beliefs that are acted on are known and declared by the Lord. If I could rewind your thinking to Hebrews chapter number four, we saw that the word of God is living, active, powerful, and sharper than any double-edged sword, revealing the thoughts and the intents of the heart. In other words, you can't fool God. The Bible says everything is naked, bare, exposed before him with whom we must give an account. And so when we go before God, when we bring our life before God, there's not going to be any sort of mask we can hide behind. There's no facade we can build that can fool God. God knows our works and also declares them to be what they are. See, it doesn't matter if society says, oh, that's okay. You can keep doing that and still be a Christian. It doesn't matter if our family or our friends tell us, hey, you know what? You're good. You're better than most. And so therefore, it's okay. You just keep doing what you're doing. That's right. No, what God says is what counts. What God says is true. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. And therefore, I don't care what society, social systems, education systems, friends and family say, even though they might be wonderful and I love them. No, I've got to find out what the word of God has to say because God is the one who I have to give an account to. God is the one that knows my works and God is the one who will declare them as to what they are. In our lives, we see throughout the Bible, you can check it out in Matthew chapter 25. You can also see it in 1 Corinthians how our life and our works are going to pass before the Lord. They're going to be tested and God will be the one that declares what our works are, known and declared to the Lord. In fact, if you look at the book of Revelation, first couple of chapters, there are seven letters written to seven churches. To each one of those churches, Jesus declares, I know your works. I know your works. See, Jesus knows what's going on. God is not a distant God, you know, kind of off doing his own thing, and then every now and then he checks in on the earth. No, God, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth, the Bible says. And God is looking into the things here on earth. In fact, even angels are checking out what's going on earth. And therefore, Jesus Christ knows our works, but he also declares them. To each one of those churches, he declared what they were doing. Most of them had some good things going on. One of them didn't have good things going on. One of them was, was, was commended by the Lord. But five out of the seven, even though they may have had some good things that were said about them, there were some things he said, yet I have this against you. He said, there's still some things that are going on that are not pleasing to me. And so our works are known to the Lord, but also the Lord will declare them. In your life, it's good for us to examine our lives and say, what am I doing? Not only what am I doing, why am I doing it? What's the motivation behind it? What, what is that root that's expressing itself in this activity in my life? And therefore, if we're going to get to the heart of the issue, we've got to bring our works before the Lord and say, God, test me. Try me out. You see this all throughout the word of God. Try me, oh God. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Lead me in the way everlasting. You see, there's something that if you bring your works to God and you bring your life to the Lord and say, God, you know, I've been doing some soul searching. I've been wondering about these things in my life. I've been wondering what I'm doing, God. And therefore, here's my life, Lord. Get your finger on an area. God, show me what it is in my life. Just reveal it to me. God will make that clear to you. You're there in the book of Hebrews. Let's turn to the book of Matthew. Throughout this series, we've been in Matthew chapter 7. In fact, even last week, Matthew chapter 7. And we were looking at the house that was built on the rock versus the house that was built on the sand, likening it to our obedience and to our faithfulness to the word of God. In Matthew chapter 7, if you back up right behind those verses about being built on the rock, you'll find Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. Jesus is speaking. He's just got done talking about good trees and bad trees. I'm talking about good fruit and bad fruit, just what we're talking about today. 
activities and expressions of our lives. Here in Matthew chapter number 7, starting in verse number 21, Jesus says these words. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now, let's stop right there and take a look at the verse for a moment. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, there's a lot of people all over the world that name the name of Jesus Christ as Lord and yet have no real relationship with him. And when they die, if they die in the state that they're in currently, even though they name Jesus as Lord on the surface, that Jesus Christ declares they're not real Christians. They're not going to make it. They're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. But then he clarifies the issue and he says who will actually go to heaven. Take a look at the rest of the verse. I've highlighted it up there. It says, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven, or he who is obedient to the will of God in heaven. See, if we want to enter the kingdom of heaven, Jesus Christ isn't the author of eternal salvation to all who name him Lord, Lord. No, he's the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now, he goes on. Next verse. Take a look at verse number 22. Jesus is still speaking. He says, many will say to me in that day. Now, what is that day? That's the day that our works go before the Lord. That's the day of judgments. That's the, the day that our lives will be examined and Jesus will know and declare our works. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. Now, see, there it is again. Don't you know that when God repeats himself in the word of God two times in two verses, we ought to perk our ears up and pay attention. What's going on here? He's emphasizing this for a reason. There are people who really do believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. And yet in their life, in their activities and in their actions, it is not expressed. It's not a, a real life of obedience. So here they are again, and they're pleading with the Lord, and they say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? See, they name the name of Jesus, and now they have prophesied? Wow. They've cast out demons? My goodness. Most of us haven't done that. Well, they, they've done many wonders. Wow. Now, now, we would look at that and we would say, well, surely they're Christians. I mean, how could God approve of somebody and allow them to do miracle signs and wonders, cast out demons and prophesy if they weren't a real Christian? And yet, if you examine the word of God, he just got done talking about false prophets. In fact, all throughout the Bible, you will find false prophets, people who prophesied for personal gain, people who prophesied so that they could have an audience with the king or get on the king's good side, people who prophesied out of their own will rather than the will of God. Last week, uh, Pastor Luke was talking about King Saul. King Saul, the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied, and there was even a saying in Israel, is Saul among the prophets? And yet his life of disobedience ripped the kingdom from him and even his life. And so we need to pay attention and say, prophecy, hey, that's cool. And yes, that can be done in the name of the Lord. And yet, that is not the mark of a real Christian. It's not the mark of real, true obedience. It, it can be something that's expressed from a Christian's life, but it's not the mark of it. Cast out demons. There were people that you can read about in the book of Acts that would go around traveling from place to place and cast out demons. And they would say, I cast you out in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, right? And, and here they were. It, obviously, they had some sort of success with that because they traveled around doing that. Now, we know that eventually they got their, 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 their behinds kicked. You understand what I'm saying? That's, that's the nice way of saying it. And finally, have we not done many wonders in your name? We think about wonders, miracles, signs, and wonders. We think, oh, my goodness, that has to be something that's done only by Christians. Well, listen, there are lying signs and wonders you see all throughout the Bible. Janus and Jambres that opposed Moses did similar signs and wonders that Moses did, and it hardened the heart of Pharaoh. And therefore... Those are not the marks of true Christianity, but a life of obedience is. Let's take a look at the next verse to see this even further. Verse 23. And then I will declare to them. Then I will declare to them. See, our works are known and declared by the Lord. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. See, that's where the rubber meets the road. Even though they had some good things in their life, they prophesied, they cast out devils, they did miracle signs and wonders in his name, their practice was lawlessness. Now, for the Christian, we might look at this and we say, my goodness, am I even saved? I was reading some commentaries and even John Wesley had to stop at these verses and say, Lord, is this me? I mean, it, it, in my own personal studies, the conviction that comes from these verses, very serious verses, we look at this and we say, my goodness, am I even saved? And yet the difference is, is we see people that may have done some good things, and yet their practice 
was lawlessness. In our lives, we may mess up, we may sin, we may trip up every now and then, but our practice is righteousness. Are you listening? That's the difference is a life of obedience to the will and to the way of God. Not doing a couple good things and then our practice is lawlessness. No, we might sin, we might mess up, but hey, I'm putting that under the blood of Jesus. I'm asking for forgiveness. I'm repenting of that. I'm doing what it takes to learn how to not do that anymore. I'm growing in the grace of God, and my practice is righteousness. My life is a life of obedience, not of rebellion to the will and to the way of God. Are you listening today? So beliefs that are acted on, number one, are known and declared by the Lord. Second thing is beliefs that are acted on, number two for today, carry us through suffering and persecution. Beliefs that are acted on, number two, are carry us through suffering and persecution. Now, when you know that you're doing the will of the Lord, it doesn't matter what circumstances are coming against you. Why? Because you will continue and you will endure because you're being obedient. Just like a good soldier in the army knows that he's going to be facing the enemy's fire, and yet he has an order that he has to go in obedience to advance. And in our lives, it's no different. You know, there's a lot of things that are coming against us in our lifetime. In fact, the Bible promises us that there are going to be problems and trials and persecutions in our life as Christians. You say, Pastor, I don't like those promises. I don't either. See, and you don't have to go around confessing them or praying for them to get them. They're going to come. Paul wrote Timothy, he said, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. We look at that and we say, my goodness, how, how does that work? How am I going to make it? Here's how obedience. See, even in the parable of the sower, you find the sower sows the word and the word falls on different kinds of ground. One of the kinds of ground is the stony soil. And because it doesn't have a very deep root when the sun rises, the plant is withered, and it dies. Well, what is that likened to? Well, Jesus explains the parable later on. He says that when the sun arises, persecution arises for the word's sake. That tells me something. If the sun rising is like persecution coming for the word's sake, that means that every day. Are you listening? Every day, just like the sun rises, every day, you can count on it. Day in, day out. What's going to happen? There's going to be heat. There's going to be pressure. There's going to be trials that I go through every day. Why? Because just like the sun rises, here comes the trial. Here comes, If I open my eyes and the sun is shining, hey, it, it, I'm facing something today. It's going to be something that takes place. I don't have to confess it. I don't have to believe God for it. I just know that it's coming. But what I do need to do is walk in obedience and, and, and walk in the will of God. Why? Because that will carry me through every day. That will carry me through the suffering. That will carry me through the trial. That will carry me through the pain. And so our beliefs that are acted on carry us through suffering and persecution. Acts chapter 4, let's take a look at it in the Word. Some great examples for us. Acts chapter 4. Let me set the story while, while you're turning in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. The apostles have received the promise of the Holy Spirit, a, a man who is lame, sitting at the gate, and, and the disciples are coming in, the apostles are coming in during the hour of prayer, and they see this man, he's begging, and he looks up to them, and they say, silver and gold we do not have, but what we do have, we give you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. Grab a hold of this man, lift him up, he starts leaping, jumping around, he's completely healed, he's rejoicing, he's over 40 years old, and everybody knew this guy, because he was always sitting there, and so they're all excited for him, they're praising God, and, and, and the religious leaders of the day, the, the Sanhedrin and the high priest and all them, they hear about this uproar, and so they, they send for the disciples, and they bring them, and, and they start to question them, and, and they question the man, and this is where we pick up the story. Here they are, and they're, they're trying to find out what's going on. Now, we would have thought, this, this isn't that weird, you know? Jesus has just been on the scene. Jesus has been doing miracles, signs, and wonders. Now, here come his disciples. Here come the apostles, and they're doing the same thing. So what's the big deal? And yet, there's a persecution that arises for the word's sake. Acts chapter 4, verse number 18 through verse number 20. Acts chapter 4, verse number 18 says this. It says, so they, speaking to the high priest, the Sanhedrin, they called them, the, the apostles, and commanded them. Not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. There's that persecution. They commanded them not to speak at all, nor to teach in the name of Jesus. Verse number 19, but Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. In other words, they just put it right back in their face. They said, well, I'm sorry, excuse me, is it right to, to listen to you more than to God? You tell us. Now, any religious leader can't answer that, right? They can't say, well, you listen to us. You know, we're the religious leaders, and, and therefore, you, no, no, they're going to say, well, no, you should be listening. 
listening to, to God, right? And I love how it says in the New Living Translation, I'll put it up on the overhead for you, Acts 419, New Living Translation, Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? See, that, that puts it a little bit more bluntly there, huh? No, God doesn't want us to obey man. God wants us to obey God. And therefore, if we're going to please God, we've got to obey God and not man. Acts chapter 4, verse number 20. Back to the New King James, Acts chapter 4, verse 20. It says this, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. In other words, the expression of our life comes from what we believe. See, they saw something. What did they see? They saw Jesus. They saw his life. They saw the miracles, signs, wonders that he did. They, they, they saw him on the cross, and then they saw him resurrected. What did they hear? They heard the word of God. They heard the teaching of Jesus Christ. They heard the promises of God. They heard the word opened up to them. They heard the word became flesh. They heard Jesus, and therefore now they had a faith in Jesus, and that faith was not just a dead faith. No, that was a living faith. It was a faith that was turned into a conviction. It was a burning passion on the inside of them, and they said, doesn't matter what you say. doesn't matter what you do. We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. It's an expression of our life. Our obedience comes from our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the story's not over here. See, they, they go out from their presence. They're warned. They, they tell them, you know, no, listen, we don't want you to say, speak in this name again. You go. So they go out, and they go back to the believers, and they report to them everything that happened. And they're continuing on in the temple. They're continuing teaching and preaching. Now, once again, here come the religious leaders. They go, and they lock them up in jail. They take them in jail, and now they have them overnight in jail, and the apostles are there in jail. And in the middle of the night, an angel appears to them. Angel says, hey, what are you guys doing here in jail? You guys need to get out of here. So he lets them out, and he locks up behind him. Now, I'm paraphrasing now, okay? So, so just stay with me for a second. So they, they leave now, and they go back to the temple courts in the morning, early in the morning. They are preaching and teaching, telling the people about Jesus once again. And the religious leaders come, and they go, and they tell the guards, okay, guards, we need you to go and get those, those guys from prison that we locked up last night. And so the guys go. They check the prison doors. Everything locked up. Everything's secure. Everything's the way it should be, except... No disciples. What happened? So they start scratching their head. They say, we don't, we don't know what happened. Everything's locked. Everything's the way it should be. Everything's secure. The guards are still here, but there's no prisoners. And so they go back and they report this to the high priest. They report this to the council. And they say, we don't know what happened. You know, everything was locked up. Everything's the way it should be. And yet they weren't there. And so while they're sitting around scratching their heads, somebody says, hey, 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 are you looking for those guys that we locked up? They're out there in the temple preaching right now. So they send for them again. Okay, guards, go get them. So they go out. They get them, but they get them peaceably. Why? Because they were afraid of the people. They thought they were going to cause an uproar. And so they go and they say, gentlemen, will you, will you please come with us? So they say, all right, yeah, what, whatever, you know, let's go. Once again, here we go again, you know. So they go on back. And now here we pick up the story. Acts chapter number 5. Acts chapter number 5 this time. Verse number 27 through verse number 29. Acts chapter 5, verse number 27 and when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and tend to bring this man's blood on us. So he's mad. He's probably foaming at the mouth, spitting a little bit, veins popping out of his neck, maybe out of his forehead, you know. And he's just mad at him, and he's saying, Look at what you're doing. You guys, we told you not to do this. Now you're still doing it. You're not obeying us. Now look at the response of the apostles. Verse 29, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. In other words, maybe you didn't get it last time when we asked the question, should we obey you or God? Maybe you didn't have the right answer. So this time we're not going to ask, we're just going to tell you, we ought to obey God rather than men. Doesn't matter what you bring against us. Doesn't matter the persecution. Doesn't matter the trial. What matters is, is that we're walking in obedience to the will and way of God. Now, again, the story's not over. They go out. They beat them. Okay? They command them not to teach in the name. They beat them, and then they let them go once again. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says they went out rejoicing. That they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. Now, in our lives, we could look at that and say, that's crazy. You know, I, I know me personally, I would have been walking out saying, man, I should have stayed a tax collector. I didn't sign up for this. Man, I should have stayed with the fish. At least I understand fish. You know, fish understand me. We have an agreement here. I catch you, I sell you, I make a living, and we're good. I didn't sign up to get beat. And yet, here these guys leave their presence of the council. After getting beat up, 
with joy. Why? Because they were counted worthy to suffer. They were counted worthy. What does that mean? That means that they were privileged enough to obey God to the point of sharing in Jesus' sufferings. And that's what this is all about, is having joy through the trial. Which brings us to the last thing for today. Beliefs that are acted on, number one, are known and declared by the Lord. Number two, beliefs that are acted on carry us through suffering and persecution. Final thing for today, beliefs that are acted on bring blessings. Beliefs that are acted on bring blessings. I don't know if anybody's told you this. I don't know if you even believe this. But God wants to bless your life. Plain and simple. God is interested in you having a blessed life. Now, a lot of times people hear that and they turn off. They say, no, God doesn't want me blessed. That's obvious by my life. You know, I, I'm not having a good life. I'm not having a good time. I'm getting beat, but I'm not rejoicing. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time. My finances, my family, having a hard time going through those struggles and sufferings. And, and I'll be obedient, but you know what? It's just my cross to bear. It's just, you know, what I've got to endure. And someday in the sweet by and by, God's interested in blessing me when I'm in heaven. But now here on earth, I don't think God's really interested in me. And yet, the Bible, all throughout the Bible, you can find out that God is interested in our lives. God is looking for a life that's devoted to him and that's obedient to him. And God wants to bless your life. That's why Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. And sometimes we get so caught up and we say, oh, God wants to bless you. That's just about money. I knew this church was about money. It's not about money. The way we define blessing in this church is the capacity to succeed. The capacity to succeed. With your family, the capacity to succeed. With, with your finances, yes, the capacity to succeed. In your business, the capacity to succeed. In, in, in your relationships, the capacity to succeed in your marriage and with your kids and whatever it is that you're going through, the capacity to succeed. God wants to bless your life. And when you walk in obedience, now you open yourself up to the blessings of God. There is a blessing that comes with obedience. There's a freedom that comes with obedience. Now it's no longer just rules and regulations and, and we're bound by sin and we're, we're trapped. No, Jesus has opened the door wide and said, I want you to live a blessed life. I want you to live a life with the capacity to succeed. And therefore, as you walk in obedience to my will and to my way, what you sow, you will also reap. If you sow obedience, you will reap the blessings of that obedience. God wants to bless us. He wants us to live a blessed life. We saw in part one that there are eternal blessings. If you remember Revelation chapter 22, verse 14, I'll just pop it up on the overheads for you. Revelation chapter 22, verse 14 says this. It says, blessed are those who do his commandments. See, there's a blessing that comes with following the will and the way of the Lord. And it says that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. In other words, that means that if we do his commandments, Jesus Christ becomes the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Therefore, now we have a right to the tree of life. We're going to live with him forever and ever. And we now may enter through the gates into the city. That's the new Jerusalem. We get to be with God forever and ever. We have audience with the king. And now we can sit with our father and we can be with him. That's an eternal blessing. But remember, we also talked about things here on the earth. We are promised in the word that God's commandments are not a burden. 1 John 5, 3, if you want to write down that reference and look at it later. His commandments are not a burden to us. They're not just a cross that we bear. No, the cross is the joy that is set before us. Why? Because we know that as we go through that persecution, as we go through that trial, that there is a blessing that comes with our obedience. And we can rejoice like those disciples, like those apostles. We can have joy in our lives. Because we know that what we're going through doesn't compare with the glory that's going to be revealed in us. <laughs> Psalm chapter 112, verse number 1. I'll put it up on the overheads for you once again. Psalm 112, verse 1 says, praise the Lord, or hallelujah. Blessed is the man. Some translations say happy to be envied or joyful is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. See, not just, not just being blessed and happy. But now all of a sudden we are fearing the Lord, walking in obedience to his ways, and we delight in his commandments. Or the New Living Translation says those who delight in obeying his commandments. Why do we have that joy? Because we know that there's a blessing that comes with our obedience. Now all throughout the word of God, Old and New Testament, we're promised things with our obedience. We're promised a place in the family of God. We're promised a friendship with Jesus. We're promised strength in the storms of this life. We're promised prosperity and success and on and on and on and on. Too many references, too many verses, too many promises. 
to sight. So take some, take some time this week and look for the promises. Look for those blessings that come with obedience. Last verse for today. Just want to take a look at this. James chapter 1. James chapter 1, if you will. Find Hebrews. Next book right after that is James. James chapter 1, very familiar section of Scripture talking about being not just hearers but also doers of the word. James chapter 1, verse number 25 says these words. James chapter number 1, verse number 25 says this. It says, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty. There's that freedom. See, Jesus' law isn't a burden. It isn't a prison cell. No, it's the perfect law of liberty. He who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work. There's our obedience. Look at this. This one. Everybody say this one. Oh, come on. Everybody say this one. one. Say, I am that one. one. Say, I am that one. one. This one will be blessed in what he does. Let's put our definition in there. Hold on a second. Let's put our definition in there. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will have the capacity to succeed in whatever they do. That's good news. And that's the blessing of the Lord that comes with our obedience. What did we learn today? We learned, number one, beliefs that are acted on are known and declared by the Lord. Second thing we learned is that beliefs that are acted on carry us through suffering and persecution. Final thing that we learned for today is that beliefs that are acted on bring blessings, the capacity to succeed. If you got something from the word of the Lord today, come on, give God a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to talk to you guys before you leave. A bunch of people got up and left. That's okay. They can hear me out there in the breezeways, hear me in the bathrooms in the foyer or the foyer, depending on where they're from. And uh, I want you guys that can hear my voice out there to stay put and listen up too, because God wants to speak to you right where you're at. Last service, somebody out there that left, I watched them walk out. They stopped and they listened. And they ended up needing what I'm about to express to you, and they came back into the church service. And so I want to speak to you guys. I want you guys to just take a moment. Don't let anything distract you. Turn off your cell phone. Don't pass out notes during this time. I want you to focus in because the next couple of moments could decide your eternal destiny. I want to talk to you guys. What if today was your last day on the earth? Think about it. You don't have to express anything right now. Just think about this. What if? Let's say you walked out of this place today. You got in your car. You started your car. Your heart stopped. You died. Closed your eyes here on earth and you opened your eyes in eternity. Where would you end up? Would you go to heaven? Or would you go to hell? Just answer that question in your heart. No one will know the answer, but you and God. Now, let's examine your answer because your answer tells a lot about where you're at with God. Sometimes people look at that and they say, well, I would go to heaven because I don't believe in hell. You know, I, I, I just don't see that as, as real. God's a good God, and why would he do that? And, and you know, I, I just think that, you know, all roads lead to heaven. And, and, and you know, you'll get there your way. I'll get there my way. Everybody's going to get there some way. And, and, and don't worry about it. I appreciate what you're trying to do, but, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find my own way there. problem with that is that, did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that all roads lead to heaven? It's like saying all roads lead to the moon. Not going to happen. We understand that in the physical, but in the spiritual, we think, oh, whatever I want to do, whatever you want to do, whatever the church says. No, it doesn't matter. It's about what God says. Don't you think that God, who created the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, carried out in the Son Jesus, beaten bloody and hung on a cross, don't you think that If he did all that, that he would tell us how to get to heaven. Well, he does. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. That means it's God's heaven, and we got to get there God's way. Not going to get there your way. Not going to get there my way. Not going to get there some well-meaning church committee's way. There's one way we're going to get to heaven, and that's God's way. And just because you deny hell's existence doesn't make it any less real. Because, you know, that's like saying, I don't believe in semi-trucks. Well, go stand out on the slow lane of the freeway. You'll meet one face-to-face sooner or later. And so just because you say, oh, I don't believe in hell, well, listen, the Bible talks about hell. Old and New Testament, Jesus talked about hell. And therefore, we're going to have to face the facts. We're going to have to take a look at what the Bible has to say and make a decision based on what he says and not what we think. Sometimes people say, well, you know what, that's a good thing because, you know what, I believe that God lets good people into heaven. And God wants me to be good. I used to be bad. I changed my act. Now I'm good. I've done a lot of good things throughout my life. I gave money to charities helped people out, been nice to my neighbors, got involved in social justice and missional things. 
That's all great. That's all wonderful. I'm glad you're doing those things. But could you just show that to me in the Bible? If that gets you into heaven. It's not there. No one in the Bible say help out. Give your money to charities. Clean up your act or be good. That you can be good enough to get into heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say get involved in social justice or missional things. Be nice to your neighbors. It's not what this is about. Because, you know, the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. And the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not going to get there on your own merit or on your own goodness. In fact, our goodness compared to God's goodness is like filthy rags. What does that mean? That means they're going to get tossed out. Come on today, let's love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth and not play games. If that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, you're not going to make it. And I love you enough today to tell you the truth. Come on, listen up. Your eternal life's at stake. Some of you might be thinking, well, I, I get that, but I was raised in church. Parents told me we were Christians. I always thought of myself as a Christian. Went to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. Parents had you baptized or christened as a child. They hung a cross for St. Christopher around your neck. You were born in America. America is a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, or Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians, right? Wrong. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible? Nowhere. Check it out. Nowhere does it say, raised in church, parents tell you you're a Christian, or you think that you're a Christian, that that makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you attend religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized or Christian as a child, but that gets you into heaven. And again, nowhere in the Bible does it say that where you're born decides where you go to heaven or not. Not about being born in America. America is not the Christian nation or any other nation for that matter. And again, I don't see anywhere in the Bible that it says that because you're not some other religion that by default God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. If that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, come on today. Listen up. You're not going to make it. Some of you might be thinking, well, Pastor, I understand that, but not only when I was a child did I go to church. Here I am sitting in church right now, and, and, and I consider myself to be a Christian. It's great. I'm glad you're here today, but just could you, could you just show that to me in the Bible where you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? It's like me saying I could go to Angel Stadium in Anaheim, wear an angel's uniform, bring my bat and my ball, call myself an angel, sit in the dugout, and think that I'm going to get to play in the game. You know what's going to happen? They're going to find me sitting there, drag me out, and lock me up. Why? Because I am not a part of the angels organization. And therefore, you can't just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, and that makes you a Christian. Remember, Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So come on, let's talk today. What makes you think you're going to get into heaven? Sometimes people say, well, you know what, I, I, I appreciate that and I, I understand that, but my last church I got involved. I helped out, I sang in the choir, made decisions at that church, taught in the Bible classes. People thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card to that church. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. But just could you show that to me in the Bible where church involvement gets you into heaven? It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible say you help out, sing in the choir, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions, teach in the Bible classes, or people think of you as a leader, that that gets you right with God, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. Nowhere. Check it out. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible God's waiting at the gates of heaven looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter. It simply doesn't work like that. Come on today. Let's love you enough, respect you enough, honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Some of you said, but wait a second, I know God. Somebody told me that if I knew God, I, I'd be a Christian headed for heaven. I know God. I could quote scriptures to you, Old and New Testament. I celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of my life, sing the songs. Therefore, I'm a Christian. But if you'd read your Bible, you'd know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. If you read your Bible, you would know the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures in the Bible. It's recorded. And yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. Come on, look up here. Not about head knowledge or mental assent towards God. Knowing who he is. But rather this is about your heart. God has always been after your heart. All through the Bible, God's looking for a heart. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Jesus was speaking to a religious leader of his day. Let me tell you about him. His name was Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a good guy. Did a lot of good things throughout his lifetime. He was raised up in his church, got involved. He attended. He became one of the leaders. And in fact, he was one of the teachers of Israel. And, and he was a great man, did a lot of good things. People wanted to find out about God, they'd go to Nicodemus. And he could preach the scripture. He could sing the scripture. How many of us could do that? He could debate the scripture. He gave his money. And yet this great man, when he comes to Jesus, Jesus doesn't pat him on the back and say, Nick, man, whoa, just keep doing what you're doing and I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does he say? He says, Nicodemus, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? You must be born again. 
Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it to the coals, made it out to be something that it's not. But listen, that's not what about society says. Rather, it's about what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you the book of Revelation, one of those letters that we were talking about to the churches there in the book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says these words. He says, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are graphic words for the mouth of Jesus. But what is he saying? What's lukewarm? What's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why do I say look out? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, I'm going to give you an opportunity just like this. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, three, bang, pop my hands together when I say three. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to lift your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to be born again. I want to be headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. There's a lot of people here and you're going to see me. Uh-huh. Might be. But get over that embarrassment. Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever? And no one would make that trade. Moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity away from God? Come on. You're not that dumb, but the devil thinks you are. He's going to try and talk you out of it. You're battling in the flesh right now, but hey, push past all that and let's go for God. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better than being in hell away from God forever and ever. Jesus made this statement. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. I'm a man. I'll see your hand go up. Count it. You put it right back down. But he also said on the other opposite end of that statement, he said, if you deny me, I will deny you. So today, your call, your choice. You can sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right. Or you can give God all of your heart and all of your life in a safe and friendly place. I've done my job. I've loved enough to tell you the truth. God's done his job sending Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. Died for the forgiveness of our sins. But he was raised again to life so that you and I could live with him forever. Now it's your turn. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, today make sure. Who should raise their hand? You've never done this, never given God all your heart in your life. Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on, you can get right with God in this safe and friendly place. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online, wherever you're at, get ready to get your hands up. God is watching. And then if you're on campus, you can tell an usher right afterwards or come into the church service. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go all together on the count of three. Get ready to get your hands up. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me right now. Thank you. There's one. God bless you. Who else? Two, three. Thank you. Four, five, six. Thank you. Seven. Thank you. Up on top. Eight. Got you up there. Eight wise people already. There's nine right there. Got you. Thank you. Ten up there. Thank you. God bless you. Ten wise people already. Eleven, twelve. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? Real quick. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Thank you. Got you. Anybody else real quick? Seventeen up top. Got you up there. Seventeen. Anybody else real quick? Seventeen wise people. More? Eighteen. Uh, How many in the family room? Four? Eighteen, nineteen, twenty. About somewhere in there. Twenty wise people already. Listen. Hey, I didn't embarrass them. Come on. I won't embarrass you. If you need to get right with God, just simply raise your hand right now. Anybody else real quick, you need to get right with God. You know you need to do this. Come on. Just pop it up. Pop it up. Anybody else real quick? Thank you. Got you back there. Anybody else? 21, 22 up there. Got you. Thank you. 22 wise people. 23. Got you up there. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? Where are you at, number 24? Come on. You're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, you should. Go for it. Who else? Come on today. Thank you. Got you right there. 24. 25, you're just sitting there waiting. Come on. Come on, let's not wait any longer. Don't miss this opportunity. God's tugging at your heartstrings right now. You just need to simply respond to him in obedience. Come on, thank you. Gotcha, 25. Anybody else real quick? Real quick, come on, come on. You need to give your heart and life to Jesus. The last call, is that a hand up there? Wave it at me if it is. No, scratching your head. I'll still count you. How'd I get to heaven? Thank you, gotcha right there. Thank you, 26. All right, anybody else? The last call, this is it, come on. If that's you, you know you need to get right with God. There's 26 others already. 
If that's you, you know you need to do this. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Last call. Here we go, here we go. Anybody else, anybody else, anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a praise for 26 wise people. Woo! God is so good. Now, listen, all 26 of you, or if you're number 27 or number 28, God just spoke. Hey, you, you thought you snuck out. You thought you snuck through. Thought that God missed you. God has not forgotten you. If you didn't raise your hand, but you should have, listen up. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand. We're all going to give a clap and a shout. Elijah's going to lead us in a song. As we do that, if you raise your hand, you should have raised your hand. Get a hold of your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church. Coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. And, and, and I want you to get your stuff, get in the aisle, and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies today. But we can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Hey, it's not too late. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. Come on, no one leave during this time. Let's welcome them as they come. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. From the family rooms, bring your kids. Come on, come on. You're welcome at this time. Come on in. From the foyer, outside, come on in. Come on in. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. They're still coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. You can come too. There's room for you down here. Come on. Come on, come on. Grab your kids. Nudge your neighbor. Say, come on, friend. I'll go with you. Come on, come on. They're still coming. Come on, let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. You can come too. They're still coming from the family rooms. You can come. Come on. Come on, we got some time. We'll wait for you. Come on down. Come on down. Come on down. All right, all right. Hey, is they're still coming? If you need to come, just make your way down right now. Just come on down if that's you. You know that you need to do this. There's still time. So we're, we're here for you. Come on down. Hey, everybody. All right. Thank God you guys have come. We're excited for you. All right. Now, listen. This is the best decision of your entire life right now, to follow Jesus. Okay? So you can put a smile on your face. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. You haven't come to a funeral. You came to a birthday celebration. Your birthday. You're brand new. That old man, yeah, he's dead. But, hey, there's a brand new person. It's coming alive right now, okay? Now, I want to introduce you all to a friend of mine right over here to my right, your left. See this guy in the blue jacket? This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's a really good guy, okay? Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you wonder when you go to church, are they weird? Listen, this is about as weird as it gets today, okay, right up here. He's cool, all right? Nothing weird's going to go on. I'm going to let you know what he's going to do in advance so that you're not wondering, not afraid, okay? First thing he's going to do, he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart, and you're going to be born again. Second thing he's going to do is he's going to give you some free information, a little book that our pastor wrote called Welcome to Your Destiny, Easy Steps to a Successful Future with God. It's thin. It's easy to read. You need to sit down and invest maybe 20, 30 minutes if you read it slow into finding out what to do next in your walk with God. Now, listen, you invest more time into television, movies, books, all sorts of other things, phone conversations, video games, all that stuff. You can invest 20 to 30 minutes to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Okay? Easy reading. It's free. We're going to give it to you. Third thing he's going to do is going to give you what we call a spiritual personal trainer. Heard of a physical trainer at the gym helps you get strong, right? Spiritual personal trainer is the same thing spiritually. They're going to help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. We like to describe it like this. It's a friend in church who will help you to go on with the ways of God and not go back to your own way or go back to serving the devil, but that you go on serving the Lord for the rest of your days. Okay, it's five weeks, it's easy, it's free, he'll tell you how it works, okay, and you need to do it. Now listen, I'm going to make a promise to you all right now, okay, here's the promise. Give us one year of your life here at this church, sitting in the word of God, week in, week out, get into church as much as you can, get as much of God as you can, and submit to the word of God that you hear here at The Rock. And after that year, you'll look back on your life, and God will give to you the rest of your life, so blessed, that capacity to, su to succeed that you'll just say, man, I never knew it could be this good. That's the promise. Am I lying, everybody? Am I telling the truth? All right. See, they know. They know. So if you guys will do this, if you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise as they go. Woo, God is good.